I'm going to get us started. It is 3 p.m. here in California. We want to start right on time. My name is Nora Wolf-Kristan, and I want to welcome everyone to Working Together for Wellness, a mindful approach to school site leader and teacher collaboration for whole school wellness. We are relatively newly funded mental health technology transfer center out of SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration. And we are funded to support the mental health workforce and really support the skills to be able to meet the needs of our region, which are the Pacific Islands, California, Arizona, Hawaii, Arizona, and Nevada. But we also, of course, support everyone else who wants to join us for the conversations that we have. And we have two specialty areas. We have school mental health and youth of transition age. And so the school mental health is what brings us into conversation today. I'm going to move us forward. So as I mentioned earlier, we offer a we offer a slew of services, one of which are webinars like this, which our goal is particularly to support the folks like you who are in the field to feel resourced, to feel connected, and to feel that you've got thought partnership and the kind of technical assistance to help you move your practice forward. So like I said earlier, we've got a ton of different types of the ways that we serve you, regional trainings, newsletters, et cetera. And if you sign up for our newsletter, which you'll be able to at the end of the webinar, you'll be able to get all of our services. I want to just ground us in why we're in, why we are all here together today. So this is part of our school mental health series. We are really concentrated not only in the concrete practices that usually come in acronyms, MTSS, trauma-informed, SEL. We're also really focused on the human, the humanization practices that allow us to connect and reconnect in our school service systems. So today's conversation is how do we, not just for our students, but also for ourselves as school employees, as the adults in the systems who are working together or working alongside each other to support young people, how do we do that kind of work? So we're going to concentrate on talking about how do we continue to maintain personal sustainability? How do we balance personal sustainability and professional sustainability? How do we learn about school site-specific roles and all the different ways that we can collaborate, really understand how that uplifts school culture and climate, and then explore the linkages between school leader wellness, teacher wellness, and student outcomes. So we'll start by introducing our team. We're going to go into framing our work. We have, like I said earlier, I'm so excited, we have an incredible panel from Camino Nuevo that is being held by our partner, The Teaching Well, and they'll be able to move into some questions and answers and then close out together. So I wanted to start here with Anel Nodding's quote, and I'm going to read it out loud and then ask for folks who are with us to just do a quick reflection about how this quote strikes you. How does it land? How does it sit with you? So I'm going to read it. And as I read it, if you can put in the chat box to the left, what comes up for you? We will not find the solution to problems of violence, alienation, ignorance, and unhappiness in increasing our security, imposing more tests, punishing schools for their failure to produce 100% proficiency, or demanding that teachers be knowledgeable in the subjects they teach. Instead, we must allow teachers and students to interact as whole persons, and we must develop policies that treat the school as full community. And now nodding. I want to take a moment and invite those of you who are online with us to just put, how does this land with you? What comes up for you? Hear the quote or when you read the quote. And I'm going to encourage our presenters to also put their thoughts in the chat box as well. Okay, so we've got some like massive agreement from Chile and Hawaii. Okay, so maybe there's agreement about what it looks like to be allowed to feel whole as an educator. And Candace, who will be hearing from later on also agrees that our solutions come from wholeness, from whole people. I think we'll be getting into what that wholeness means for us. And Melissa, who we'll be hearing from later, also points out that when we think about this term like whole child, whole school, that actually we also need to encourage us to think about whole teacher and whole educator as well. Susan in Nevada, who will be the next presenter in our next webinar workshop series, so glad you're on, is also naming how relevant this work is. And also Chanel from Hawaii also is wondering how to involve parents and guardians in this work as well, right? So the we, potentially, the instead we must allow teachers and students, we can also think about we must allow every adult who is supporting the young people that we love and we care about to feel whole and, and held 
Wonderful. So I appreciate you continuing to put in your thoughts. I want us to just ground in that as we move forward. So the other piece to add, and this is from Joyce Dorado, UCSF Heart, is that Joyce Dorado describes that a trauma system is not only a young person who is experiencing trauma or having difficulty in regulating in emotion and behavior, but that the experience of trauma or dysregulation or harm or an overwhelmed coping system also asks us to think about the entire social environment and system of care that's not able to support that young person. So when we talk about teacher collaboration, educator collaboration for school wellness, we're actually doing it in a both and. We're doing it to support the young person and we're doing it in the context of the whole system. So when we are talking about a trauma-informed or or healing-centered culture, I want to suggest that educator wellness and school employee wellness is at the center, that's the nucleus of that work, and that we cannot expect young people to come to school ready to learn unless we have teachers that are supported to come to school ready to teach and school leaders that are ready to come to work ready to lead. It is concentric circles of care. In that place, before I move us into the next, into our panel, I want to offer that this is something that we at the Pacific Southwest Mental Health PA Center say a lot, that there is this adage that self-care and wellness and collaboration is really all nested in this idea that we can't take care of others until we take care of ourselves. And a part of what we want to deepen that thought in is that, yes, it's important to give ourselves oxygen and to nurture ourselves. It's also important to think systemically and environmentally. So in that same frame, right, if we're only thinking about what happens when we put on the oxygen mask in order to then help other folks to breathe, we have to also think about, well, what happens if those oxygen masks aren't prepared to drop, if the flight attendants haven't been prepared to support people in the event of an emergency, if the entire plane culture hasn't been trained in potentially in crisis readiness response and recovery. To that end, we want not only just to think about the individual, but the entire plane culture in thinking about the practices, structure, cultures, and policies that hold up our wellness and then hold up our healing and our regulation. Because as we know that healing and wellness are two related, but often different things. The last piece that I want to say before we move into our panel is that two years ago, we, we actually have data from the Gallup Healthways Wellbeing Index that found out that 46% of teachers in K-12 settings report really high levels of stress during the school year. This is the part where if everyone was not needed would say, duh, we know that, Leora. But the second piece is that this level of stress, actually, we found that the level of stress of teachers is almost parallel to the level of nurses and physicians and is in the highest in the 14 professional categories of the study. The biggest contributor to the stress that was reported of teachers nationwide was the lack of autonomy, was the lack of feeling self-determined and collectively determined, and that teachers reported a lot of wellness being focused on nutrition and focused on physical health, but not focused on mental health and behavioral health in order to help others. As we move into talking about collaboration particularly, I want to note the following pieces. We actually don't have a lot of data around the impact of teacher collaboration on student mental health, but what we do have is the data on the the relationship of isolation on educator mental health, and that in isolated communities actually create more fraction, distrust, and that collaboration is incredibly hard. And what you'll hear from the panel as we move forward is it's not just the practice of creating the time so that, okay, now we're going to have collaboration time and all educators come together. The collaboration is actually an art. It is intricate, and it is necessary to really understand the nuances that when you get people together who have been historically separated together in order to collaborate and rely on one one another and then attach to one another, all for the same outcome of student learning and student health, but that takes a lot of work. We're going to learn more about that from our partner, The Teaching Well, and our partner, Camino Nuevo, and we're going to get started. So I am incredibly excited on that note to pass it to today's team. As I mentioned earlier, we are being joined by our partner organization, The Teaching Well, that is based out of Oakland, and The Teaching Well support partners in schools in Northern California and Southern California, and I think are expanding, although I'm sure you can ask them about that, and you'll hear from Candace later. Candace is with The Teaching Well. Hey, Candace. And The Teaching Well comes together to support, and they have a framework to support schools and school systems to think about specifically teacher wellness in a really distinct way. 
Candace and the Teaching Well brought in their partner, Camino Nuevo, based in Los Angeles. If Melissa, Casey, and Mindy, these are our partners from Camino Nuevo, who are really busy and taking a lot of time out of their day to share with you their learnings around wellness. So I just want to honor the commitment they've provided us to share their thoughts. And I'm just going to do a quick, so Melissa, if you can wave. All right. And Mindy, if you can wave. Wonderful. And then Casey, if you can wave. So they're going to be introducing themselves. I'm going to move and transition the baton to Candace and then come back to close us. I am going to say a quick word before we get started, which is that if usually what happens is that folks that are on the line, they're really excited about what's being said and they want um, some needs around getting the deck, et cetera, I'm going to just point you to the handout. So there's information about the teaching well. There's also information. There's the entire deck all in the handouts. You can download them, and they will also be emailed to you at the end. And uh, I'm going to say uh, see you soon. Okay, Ken, this is all you. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Leora, for that really thorough and smoothing framing and setting of the context. I resonated with so much of that. I'm really excited to be here with our partners from Camino Nuevo, and I want to really say a little bit more about the teaching well. And so as we are so eloquently reviewed around all the different reasons why adults in school systems can often really experience so many challenges around their wellness, the teaching well was created by teachers, for teachers, in order to actually get to some of these root causes. So if you look at the fear of action that we have here, we think of this very similar to sort of that cultural iceberg that many folks are familiar with, where at the top are the pieces of culture that we can see. That's our school community, that's our pedagogy and projects and the ways that we really want our communities to thrive. But what that cultural iceberg teaches us is that underneath that water are the feelings and beliefs that often truly drive culture. And so we, we're thinking about schools in that way, too. It's often like our ability to effectively communicate with one another, receive and ask for support, our ability to communicate our boundaries or live into those boundaries actually affect how well we can do the rest of the things we want to do. And then beneath that even more, the teaching well supports this idea of the whole teacher and how do we actually provide resources that support our teachers to be whole. And so we think about the ability to know our needs at the level of the body and why that's important. I know that our presenters are going to speak to that today and that authentically kind of knowing ourselves set the platform for actually speaking and accessing the resources that we need and that that foundation sets the the tone for all the way up to reaching and accessing that thriving school community. Along that note, I guess I will say a little bit more about our program. Our program stands on four main systems of support. One is mindful mentoring with teachers. So this is time where teachers and administrators actually get one-on-one -on -one support around managing stress, emotional wellness, problem-solving, communication, just all of those things that happen in between the school day that often affect us so much. We also provide professional development around stress resilience and sustainability and a lot of other things, including trauma-informed care. We offer coaching to our administrators around how to lead from sustainability. And then we also support many of our schools through research where we actually talk and listen to teachers in that community and help to create a report that expresses the voice, the narrative of teachers, so that whole community and the leaders can create system-wide changes that affect everyone. So we, uh, we support at the individual, the group, and the whole school level. So with that being said, I'm excited to dig into uh, into the, the concept. I think this is going to be the most helpful part of just hearing from our leaders and what this actually feels like and looks like and how you have been able to find your way with it as a school community. And so I have some questions here, but I would love for this to be a dialogue and for folks to just jump in where you where you feel moved. And I did one more thing I would say is that our partner Camino Nuevo has been working on this wellness work, I'm sure from the very beginning, but the teaching world has been privileged to be a partner with Camino for the past three years. 
And so we also believe that this work takes time. And ultimately, once seeds are planted, we have to be willing to continue to show up, and, and you all have been doing that. So our first question is really just starting at the beginning is how do you define personal well-being and what does that have to do with professional well-being? Hi, everyone. I'm Melissa Mendoza. I am the principal at one of the communal noble sites. Casey and I work at the same site and, and Mindy partners with us from the home office. And wellness for us in terms of a pillar of the work that we do started about three years ago. Just some, a little background, I, I was one of the founding teachers at our school, and so I had been there since, since day one and had been the assistant principal for a while. And when I transitioned into the principal role, one of the challenges that I had in front of me was that our turnover rate with teachers was really high. So we would hire teachers who were really aligned to our mission and vision, super energetic, but for lack of better words, the burnout was real. So teachers would leave and essentially say, we love our school, we love the team, but it's just a lot of work. And during that time, some of our teachers had gone to professional development with the teaching well and connected me to some of the members of the teaching well, and we were able to start putting together some workshops and professional development and some personal self-care and realizing as I reflected on my teachers, I as a leader was also starting to, to feel the burn. So asking ourselves, how can we help our teachers endure this when we ourselves are pretending to endure it? for them, and we really wanted an authentic space where staff and teachers and campus aides and IAs and all staff could really share about what it takes to do the, do the work, um, because it's not for a lack of heart, and a lot of times it's not for a lack of capacity, but we had to start admitting that we're human and <laughs> that we cannot work 16-hour days every day without eventually hitting a wall. And the work that we do it is difficult. We are serving community, much like I'm sure many of yours were uh, in the heart of LA, just near Dodger Stadium. So we can't always change some of the things that are coming in. Students with trauma, we have a 14% rate of homelessness. We have 82 students with, you know, IEPs. I mean, it, it is a community that we love to serve, but we also take in some of these traumas as we're giving our all to them and then go home and have nothing left to give to ourselves or to give to our family members and really feed us to be able to do that work. So that's where it started, um, a series of, of wellness professional development, and then a conversation, a common language about what does it look like and what does it take and understanding our, our boundaries. So being okay with saying, today is my day that's not a late day and I only work until four o'clock and can I reschedule that meeting with you to another day because I need to go home you know, to the gym or to bath time with my child or to do whatever else and not feeling guilty about leading from that space. Casey, I know you can jump in on this as well. Hello, everyone. My name is Casey. I am an RSP teacher for TK through 2 here at Camino Nuevo. And I think for me as a teacher who's experienced kind of this transition firsthand that we know that this is a job of service, so we're always required to give. And I just think without personal wellness, there is no professional wellness. So if I'm not taking care of myself as a teacher, if, you know, we are not taking care of ourselves as teachers, there's no professional wellness because it impacts our ability to model best practices for students. It impacts our ability to communicate, you know, sometimes, that, which can be difficult with staff, students, and parents, and families. And I think it also really impacts our ability to teach and just our overall wellness. And so just recognizing that this is an arduous job, it's almost like how can we expect a car to drive if we don't put gas in it? And I feel like so many times as teachers, we're just running on E, constantly, constantly, constantly. And because we give so much, we forget to give ourselves the love that we give to students so freely. And so just in my own experience, this is my fifth year working in the school, I've experienced a transition with myself personally regarding the teaching well and the PD that we have had, just small things like changing what I eat. So I know what to eat to ground myself. I know what to eat to give myself a pickup in the middle of the day when I know I have to go into a class or there may be some challenging behaviors. Just small changes, you know, incremental change that we can make to support our own wellness because at the end of the day, we're here for the students. And if I know that if I'm not my best self, then I can't best serve the students in the community 
And for me, this is like life or death in situations regarding students with disabilities, because if we're not giving these children what they need, then I'm not completing my work to the fullest. And so I have learned that the better I take care of myself, the better I can serve. And so that's why I am 100% for personal wellness equals professional wellness. And when they're together, we just have wellness as a whole in our community. Hi, everyone. I can speak to this really personally, similarly to what's already been shared. I am a recovering workaholic, and in my life, it has been things that have forced me to stop and set boundaries. So I had a physical injury after a car accident several years ago that I had PT afterwards, and I learned that I have to reposition myself if I'm in pain. I actually had to learn that. I thought, you know, if I was hunched over and on my computer and my back would hurt, I would just keep going. And someone actually had to teach me to (laughs) how to relieve my own pain, which is fascinating. And then after that, I was teaching. I taught for eight years high school. And I also led small groups through an organization called Young Life. And after four years of doing that and pouring everything into it and loving it, my org leader forced me to stop doing it. And so I was forced to stop doing this extra, extra thing. And I ended up going to therapy and learning a whole lot about myself and how I was interacting with kids. And then after those two years of really learning a lot, I had children. And again, I was forced to, you know, leave work at four. And that was completely alien to me. So for me, it's been a history of being forced to set boundaries. And then once I set them, realizing how happy it makes me, but in the physical way, in the family way, and in the psychological and spiritual way, learning a lot from times where I kind of hit rock bottom of of really pushing myself too far, and then learning from that to, to set a boundary. Yeah, thank you all so much. Some of the things that really stood out to me from what I just heard is that One, your quote, Casey, that personal wellness equals professional or that professional can't exist, that just really stood out to me because I think we live in a culture where we are told, I think often unconsciously, we also tell ourselves that those two things can be separated somehow, right? And so you coming out and countering that so directly, I think really matters and that, you know, is really powerful. The thing I heard was that when you all had an opportunity to develop common language around the work that was really supportive and boundaries, I heard boundaries coming up quite quite a bit. And Melissa, what you shared about when we don't control all of the different systems that impact our children, whether it be in the community, community violence, poverty, or even the way sometimes our own school systems are set up in ways that don't always support wellness. We don't control every single aspect of that, but we do control how we resource and how we manage our own energy and how we take care of ourselves and each other. And that was really powerful to me. So thank you all. I'm wondering if there are some things specific to, like in your role, (laughs) I see that really cute picture of you, Melissa, (laughs) doing your thing. (laughs) Um, If there are some specific ways that you've noticed in your own role that you've either, you know, took care of your own sustainability or helped to promote sustainability throughout your whole school. Like, you know, for folks that are thinking about where they live within their community or their, or their structure, like, I wonder what you all would share about that. Yeah, that is me on the bike. And so I can, I can speak a little bit to that. So Transitioning from the classroom into a leadership role, it was almost like transitioning into freshman year of college where all of a sudden you're like sitting more than you're used to, you're gaining weight, you're not like, why am I in so many meetings? You're just not used to, you know, this type of lifestyle and it starts to really like pack on and I can't change the number of meetings that I have. I can't change the fact that there's leaders out there listening. You know, I I haven't figured out how to put a lunch break into my schedule, but there are things that we start to to shift. So we, you know, little things like that. I had this bike that I could sit on. Um, I used it a lot for students and then thought, hey, I can, I can use it too. So sometimes even when it's just, I have 30 minutes and I need to sit and check, you know, a hundred emails, <laughs> not doing it in a sedentary position. And I actually feel better because our work is so repetitive, right? Like we can come back and all those, the day-to-day different things happen. Essentially, we live in this, these cycles, these like school cycles where we know like October is going to be a really hard month. February is going to be a really hard month. 
the kids are going to feel a certain way when we get closer to the end of the school year. So putting in little things like that, ways to exercise. There's that. We also have um, bands, like these exercise bands that you can put in your office or even uh, if you're a teacher, you know, in the classroom and you're running small groups underneath the table. No, you know, the kids use it too. You, you model it and then providing ways for kids to let out this energy and you to do it with them because you really have to think long term. Like this is a marathon. If I want to be a leader of a school until I retire, my body has to withstand it as well. And I, I don't want to not do what I'm preaching to my staff. So that, that was one of the things. Other things that have come up are as simple as reminding um, teachers and practicing yourself to not take parent phone calls after a certain time. It is okay to set work hours. Many other occupations do this, and I find myself and our staff as well, uh, you know, taking parent phone calls, 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night, you know, 6, 7 o'clock in the morning. And so it's okay to look at it, but keeping that boundary. Um, the families, we, I, I've noticed in my experience, like, they still respect us, they still love us, and at some point, I think they even love us more because they start to understand this is a professional space where I may not abuse the time of the people that are working for my children. Even if I need to tell them what I need to say at 10 p.m., it's okay that they respond the next day after 8 a.m. You know, I coach a lot of teachers and reminding them that that's okay to set those boundaries. And at first, I was embarrassed to say, like, hey, guys, I'm going to the gym, like, twice a week. And then I will even, like, put it on my door. Like, today I'm leaving by this time. So if you need me, here are three other ways to reach me. Text, email, or, you know, if you live in L.A., there's, there's commute. I have a 90-minute commute. There are 90 minutes I'm willing to give you over the phone. I just can't do it in person because I need to get somewhere for my wellness and health. Thank you. Mindy, did you want to add anything here? Sure. So in case there's anyone at the district level or, again, in leadership, for me, you know, given what I just shared about my own personal journey as a teacher and how, how hard it was for me to learn boundaries and how easy it was for me to just work, you know, basically – like 1.5 people, what's been really important for me as a leader is to understand what we're asking of the people that we're asking things of. So as a coach and as a manager, you know, if I say to someone, all right, you need to make a schedule where you have to co-plan with all of your co-teachers because we do co-teaching at our site and you have to make sure you have some compliance time in there and you have to make sure you're co-teaching to meet all the minutes on the IEPs of everyone on your schedule. Got it? Good. So... <laughs> And if I don't know how difficult that is and if I haven't helped be the big picture of all the other parts that are in place or what hard decisions need to be made or how it's not just the person I'm talking to, it's actually three or four or five other people that also need to be a part of this, it actually might hurt someone. It might hurt someone to tell them, you know, you have to do all these things, but I'm not going to walk alongside you and help you do it. And so for me, it's just been about similar to what Melissa said, like if we have these incredible teachers like Casey, how do we keep them? And the way we keep them is to know exactly what we're asking them to do and to make sure it's possible to do it and then to come alongside them to problem solve. You know, we're problem solvers every day in this profession. Come alongside them and, and figure out how to make the choice between the good or the better. And then something that else that's on the slide is just the idea of equity. And I, you know, within the realm of special education, there's a lot of people who are often not experiencing equity. You know, there might be kids that are experiencing stigma because of having an IEP or having to be pulled out of class or having to be identified as having an adult one-on-one -on -one or having a label. That happens. Uh, one of the middle schools that I serve at right now, students are throwing around labels as a way to bully each other. And so making this connection that, you know, when kids don't feel the equity, when teachers don't feel that they're a full part of the, the co-teaching relationship and they're considered, you know, during professional development plans and they're provided with curricular resources, it's these little things that add up that make a person feel like they're not a full partner at the table, student, teacher, staff, parent, anyone. And those things impact the way we're able to show up, the way we're able to learn, the way we're able to teach, the way we're able to collaborate or not collaborate because of someone just feeling like things aren't fair and feeling, you know, they haven't been heard. So that's another connection I, I like to make from an inclusion perspective. And then, you know, just really practical things about checking in. Again, as a recovering workaholic, I never liked to check in in meetings. I'm like, we only have an hour. Why are we going to spend 10 minutes talking about each other's lives? This is such a waste of time. And my boss and people, you know, in my office have been very consistent about the check-ins 
at the top of every single meeting, you know, a quick question and we all whip around and we share something about, you know, our lives or what's on top for us. And all of a sudden after, well, maybe not all of a sudden, but finally after, you know, months and years of doing this, I've realized that, you know, I'm a human and everyone I'm working with is a human. And whether they're sharing things that are personal or professional, how many times have I been sitting in a meeting and gone, oh, that's really good to know. That's really good context to be able to work with this person. Oh, I'm so glad I know, you know, that they're struggling with this or that, you know, their strength is this or their hobby is that, or we have something really cool in common. And again, it sounds hokey for those of us who are very type A and like focused on results, but it's not. It's really a part of the fabric of, of, of collaborating with humans. And if you can't do that, you know, you can't do the work. Thank you, Mindy. Thank you so much. What would you say from a teacher perspective, Casey? Thank you, Melissa and Mindy, for sharing such great things. I have such great leaders who support me in this work, and I just wanted to acknowledge that as one of the reasons why I'm able to be successful in my role is that I have administrators and leaders who actually support me in a way in which I can complete my work with efficacy. I mean, I think from the teacher perspective, for me, the number one way I support this would be in terms of just showing up as my authentic self and me being a non-binary black, you know, gender non-conforming person helps kids see that it's okay to be different in whatever regard it may be. And it helps push the community, you know, just to think a little bit differently and how we can be inclusive, whether it's race, gender, sexuality, ability um, in any way possible. Just as a teacher who has a form of institutional power, you know, having that difference and being open about it in the community, I think makes a great difference for students in general. And I think the other way I take very seriously is ensuring that all students with disabilities are getting their services and all that they need is being provided. So, you know, collaborating with all of my teachers, making sure that I'm planning with them and working with them and that not just having a surface level relationship with my teachers, but we actually know something about each other and we're able to collaborate so that when we're co-teaching together, it's authentic and it's real. I mean, I think that helps our school wellness in a way that, you know, can't even be quantified because you build a strong relationship with your co-teacher. It just helps impact the learning of students in such a way that I, I just can't express just from the results that I have seen. And I think another way is also just thinking about my, my own privilege, you know, as a person who is neurotypical, recognizing that we are in an educational system that was created by neurotypical people for neurotypical people. So when we have our neurodivergent students, just acknowledging that this is hard. It's hard to just show up. It's hard to just be here for everyone, but it's a different tier of difficulty for those students. And I just think that always making sure another way is if I'm teaching myself, you know, always staying up on the latest research around child development. Um, I try to always make sure I'm reading about the different forms of research in autism, how trauma affects students, you know, and just thinking about what type of com accommodations do students need, how can that support all students. Always recognizing that as a teacher, I'm also like a theorist or a practitioner and that I should always be working towards using different tools to support my students. And then also sharing this information with my school community. So, you know, recently I was able to collaborate with our administrators around building inclusion in our school based on, you know, different identities as we as a school acknowledge our own privilege and just moving forward and just really being mindful of that in our interactions with children. And I think that even me thinking about myself, I'll use myself for an example. I grew up in a two-parent home. You know, finances were never an issue for me. So that is a, a, a privilege in regard to many of the students that I serve. So I have to be mindful of that, you know, when I'm interacting with students and I'm interacting with families, you know, that's just one way I can acknowledge that in communication. And I think that just the biggest thing, too, is just the collaboration piece. So once I get those resources, I always try to make sure I share it. So even for professional development, I have copies for them next week. They don't even know it from some trainings that I went to. And I always try to make sure that I'm sharing and I'm handing them out because if we're an inclusive community, then we're more likely to be a well community because if we're not including and everyone doesn't feel welcome, happy, whole, healthy, and supported, then we're not building a safe community. And I just firmly believe that the world is not a nice place. We know that. And as for Principal Mendoza stated, you know, we can't control other factors, but I believe that schools should be safe slash wellness zones where kids come and they feel included, they feel empowered, and they feel supported, and they know that when I step outside of this building, when I graduate, that I can take on whatever I need because my school community empowered me with the tools 
to really be successful. And if we have well schools, then our kids will belong to the community. We'll have wellness in our communities. And next thing you know, we'll just hope that it keeps on rolling and the wellness spreads. Oh, I, I feel like there were just so many powerful pieces that came through. <laughs> our next portion, we're going to be going into talking about best practices. And I think this could be a good way for participants to kind of get a highlight reel. It was great to hear your personal experiences as well as the concrete ways you live into this. And I'm really sitting with how big a portion or being reminded, I should say, of how huge modeling is, the way how powerful it is for Melissa, for you to model from the top, which gives permission to everyone else, right, to take care of themselves, what it means for Mindy, for you to model for your teachers and for the whole school around inclusion and setting your own boundaries and knowing yourself and how that allows you to lead. And then KC, so powerful the way you described how much it matters within your identity to be your true authentic self. I think that's something something we sometimes leave out of the, the wellness dialogue too, that our ability to be our whole selves absolutely. Like when we show up for work or when our students show up to school, if you have to leave something at the door, that's a part of you that's not well. So I'm wondering if we could transition and maybe some of these you've spoken to, but maybe like if people are, are walking out of this space, what do you absolutely want them to really think about as a best practice, like actionable? What can I do in my community? What should they take from this? I think one of the things that started to to take hold in terms of shifting just from like myself, because I can make some changes, but if I'm not talking about them, if I'm not sharing them, if I'm not creating a common language, then I'm the only one that knows how much water I'm drinking, what kind of foods I'm eating at what time. You know, so there's small ways that we start. I did use, you know, my, my leadership power to say, hey, y'all, I want to model that these are some of, like, the recipes and the snacks that I've been using or making. We have a video that our kids watch every week. And so every once in a while, I get on there and I'll take a video of myself making my green smoothie. And I'll put it on there and I'll show all the ingredients. So the whole school gets to watch it. And they're, like, little, you know, things where the kids know me as the lady with the smoothies, like Ms. Mendoza. What color is your smoothie today? Is it red? Is it green? And it wasn't something that I was like, I want to be known as the person with the smoothies. But it was, I made a small change in my life to my habits. And then I looked for ways to share the why. One of the things you see on the slide in front of you is number two, understanding the human function curve. And I think that that was really, really life-changing for me in being able to start to realize I should not feel beyond my capacity when I'm leaving work every day. And so I start to look for how my staff is leaving work. Are they getting in the elevator overwhelmed? Are people still smiling? Are we walking into professional development ready to learn or just completely exhausted? You know, providing snacks, starting CD with mindfulness, making sure that we have water on campus. And even some of those things were challenges. It took me four years to get approval to get sparkless water. <laughs> like, on our campus because it's a, something that gets charged to the credit card every month. So little things like that, you run into red tape that seems silly, but you have to continue to push to get there to, to really model. Yeah, it's like how often have you had a conversation with someone and said, how are you? And when they responded and said, fine, you didn't believe them. <laughs> and it was clear that they weren't okay. And how, you know, just really getting curious about that and saying, hmm. You know, am I going to probe further in this conversation? Am I going to ask for a separate conversation, but not really glossing over and being comfortable with people saying, yep, I'm fine, when you know that really something else is going on? From the perspective of a, a special education teacher, for me, it really is about, I think, my number one tool of communication for integrating wellness. So, you know, being able to state, you know, I'll be here this day or I have an IEP this day or giving them like an update on my schedule and then small things that I try to do is I always ask my teachers, do you need anything after we coach you together? How can I support you? What do you need? How are these students doing? And then I also make sure that I'm always providing them resources. So I try to make sure that I'm taking my title seriously as a resource specialist. A lot of times I will just print out resources like my teachers were mentioned to me they needed some summer packets and I went through my files and I printed them out packets and now the kindergarten team has all their homework for packets. So just making sure that I'm listening to people and acknowledging them and making sure that I'm not invalidating how they feel when we're communicating and we're working together and just always prioritizing students 
and I think how everyone feels is like such a great way to yeah, integrate thank wellness. Yeah, you. you know, when you think about all of this and maybe what it was like at the beginning of your journey as individuals or as a school, what were there some things that stood out as things really not to do or some some maybe some pitfalls or caution areas, maybe just briefly, because we do have to, to move forward and provide time for questions? I think if I can say just one thing about what not to do is don't push it too hard and be hard on yourself to say we were all going to do wellness and then it didn't work out. Like I was the only one who wanted to do mindfulness or I downloaded this app and nobody liked it. It takes consistency and it takes lots of trial and error and feedback. So I wouldn't be so hard on yourself and I would start small, you know, like asking people like, did everybody have water today? If you didn't, take a minute and go get some water before we start PD, and then let's go. Picking, like, the one thing that you can do and then building on it. And there were things for wellness that we tried. Like, we tried to have a jogging team. We tried to have, like, a club that was going to, like, meet after school and do yoga. Like, some of those things didn't stick, and that's okay. Thank you for that. As someone who supports schools as an outside partner, I think that piece around time is really key allowing time for things to take hold, you know, only biting off what you can chew. And Mindy, when you spoke earlier, you talked about this idea of negative peace, or that's how I've been taught that term, as being really important to acknowledge that we've all been trained to be okay when we're not okay. And that a lot of ways, part of what we're doing here is not just creating a new system of wellness, is we're countering an existing system of unwellness. And so being really aware of that, I think is really important to that to that point because we've learned our bodies and our minds have learned to find safety in unsafety and so one of the first important pieces is often just acknowledging that and allowing ourselves to have the freedom to actually name when we're not okay <laughs> so that was huge and then it uh, everything else can unfold from there as people build more safety with each other so thank you all so much we did have one more piece around collaboration for this slide, Mindy or Melissa, did you want to say a little bit more? Yeah, you can see on the slide that it says we participated in a circle for women principals that have children. So that there's different ways to collaborate around wellness, and I participate in different circles. So both with my teachers, for students, but then I joined the group. Mindy and I are in the same group. After I was already a leader, I had my first child, and coming back to leadership, as a mom, was way different. I mean, I I just couldn't live the life of a leader the way that I did before, and nor did I want to, but I didn't have the tools to really manage the stress that was coming with it. And at one point, I was like, maybe I can't do this. Maybe I need to go back to the classroom, or maybe I need to give up leadership because I, I, I need to be a mom as well. But we, the Teaching Well facilitated a mom group where we all were leaders who had had children in the last two years, and we shared those struggles and also the successes, and it was just kind of a space for us to really collaborate. So those of you that are listening today, I would also suggest that you look for teams of members in your community, in your school community, in your community that you can collectively work on wellness together, even if it's just the office had this thing going where everybody in the office would drink more water, and we would check each other and we would write it down. So just Working on it with more than one person, it starts to catch fire. And then before you know it, your whole school is practicing a wellness initiative that you really didn't set out to lead as an initiative, but it took off naturally. Thank you. That's really powerful. So our final takeaways for school districts that want to take this on, where would you say are some important starting points? And we have some bullets here that people can review, but what would you highlight? Yeah, I think Melissa said it all in terms of how a school would start small and add to that. And, and I love what this says about look at what your resources is, who's doing, you know, training for a marathon, who's already, you know, doing certain things, who, who has, is a yoga, a yogi that you didn't even know about. And I would just add to that, that it needs to be part of your strategic plan. You know, we do strategic planning every year. And so wellness would be on your strategic plan and it would have quarterly, you know, activities and assessments and surveys and check-ins. And that's the only way to really force yourself to put the resources and time and and money and and energy and effort into doing it because otherwise it'll definitely not keep going. So I would recommend putting it right there in in your strategic plan. It's totally fine to do that. You know, reading levels and math achievement and wellness can all be on that same strategic plan. Thank you. 
that's our time. I just want to really thank you all for lending your voices and for setting such a powerful example within your classrooms and your network for what it looks like to lead sustainably from the top to the bottom and the bottom to the top. So thank you. I know your families and, and communities really appreciate it. Thank you, Camino Nuevo and the Teaching Well. That was such a powerful session. I want to offer us time to, in the chat box on your left, to share what your takeaways are from the webinar. And a takeaway can also be a question that you're sitting with. And we have your emails and your contact information that connect you to having a thought partner around the work. And also we have all of our contact information at the end. But I wanted just to pause to invite us to really sit with what are our takeaways as we're, as we're leaving. I wanted to add that we've heard a lot about taking care of ourselves as professionals and also collaboration. Another way that we can take care of ourselves is advocating and creating spaces and cultures and systems for our students and ourselves and our colleagues. One way that many folks find great, great sense of wellness and healing is actually in creating a space of determination, both for the self and for the collective. And so I wanted to, to name that too. And so you've got information in the left. I'm going to offer to put takeaways, and I'm actually going to move us forward into the closing space. So a couple resources as we close. Of course, the teaching world is a resource. Your new colleagues at the Camino Nuevo are new resources. They're also teacher-led wellness um, resource banks. So Teach Strong, Teach Resiliency, which is out of Canada, the APA actually has an entire teacher stress module, Kaiser Thriving Schools, which you can find webinars and resources on school employee wellness. So I wanted to point out these are four core resources to support school employee wellness. Of course, you can get more resources and references and presenter contact information. I want to point out a couple pieces, which is moving forward in June. We've got one more webinar in our school mental health series called When There Is One School Counselor Strategies to Reach All Students Nevertheless. Susan, who's on with us, and her colleague, Will Shana, will be presenting on how to build up systems where you maybe have one school counselor in an entire community, and how do you create multi-tiered systems of support, which requires collaboration, so it builds on the conversation that we grew today. We hope to see you there. And the last piece is, if you are more interested, if you're interested to hear about the teaching while you actually have a no-cost opportunity to learn with us at our Summer Institute this June in Sacramento, June 24th and 25th. We have a two-day, you can come one day, you can come two days, with partnering with the Teaching Well, the Black Emotional Mental Health Collective, the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement, the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center for Latino Mental Health, and myself will all be leading really intensive learning sessions to enrich our practice. We really hope to see you there. Register by May 30th. These are going really fast, so we hope to see you there in June. Again, it's no cost, and there are CEUs available. I also want to end with joining our contact, our newsletter, contact information. And as we move ahead into close, we want to give time for you to give us feedback. The more feedback we get from you, the more ability we are to put on resources like this. Of course, if you need or want to contact Melissa, Casey, Candace, or Mindy to both provide questions comments. I also invite affirmation, like what resonated. Webinars are an incredibly vulnerable thing to do sometimes and to put your practice out there. So I really invite folks to give shout outs. I want to close with an incredible amount of gratitude for these four partners in the work who are taking their time to contribute to our time. As we already saw in the chat box, that was incredibly expansive. And again, if you put a question in the chat box that we didn't get to, we absolutely will speak to it after we close our webinar. So on that note, I want to say thank you so much to everyone, and we hope to see you on our next webinar. Again, a great thank you to the Teaching Well and Camino Nuevo. Thank you so much.